Hello and welcome to the week nine top 150 rankings show. Today, we're going to cover all the biggest changes we've made to our rest of season rankings. Be sure to stay tuned to the end as we'll give our favorite moves to make in your fantasy league. So I think the first thing that people want to hear about is our reaction to the trade deadline. There were not a lot of trade uh, skill player moves. I talked to Silva about most of them, if not all of them, yesterday, but there's still a little bit of fallout. I'll start with you, Mark. Who would you consider maybe the biggest winner fantasy-wise in the fallout from the trade deadline? I have a few, a, a couple running backs, just because those were kind of the the markets that we were expecting. Like the Ravens were were heavily rumored to get a running back, especially Derrick Henry was tied there. Um, so I think Gus Edwards at the top is a big winner here. We saw him in the in the with the with the Ravens leading this past week against the Cardinals, you know, he got up to three touchdowns. Obviously, pretty top tier game from him, but he should remain the the running back one A there in that offense. And with this Ravens team, you know, solid offense, good defense, they should be playing from ahead in majority of their games, or at least be a neutral game script. So I think Gus Edwards is a is a pretty big winner. And then sticking in the AFC North running back pitcher, I think Joe Mixon is is a quiet big winner here at the trade deadline. Uh, the Bengals placed Chase Brown on IR ahead of their week eight matchup against the 49ers and then did not make any moves at the deadline. I was thinking maybe they could reunite with Smaj P. Ryan or something like that. Uh, but the Bengals did not do anything. And Joe Mixon's role has been really elite with the Bengals. We saw, you know, just with Joe Burrow's health, he looks back to 100 percent. This this offense, the arrow is pointing straight up and, and Mixon's role is about as elite as it comes at running back. I thought Mixon actually looked spry you know and, and he hasn't looked like that in a long time against the 49ers I'm not sure what got into him for that game but he certainly did look spry and we have mixing up to 37th overall in the top 150 Gus Edwards down in the 80s uh on the other side Jack what do you think about losers from the deadline oh you could consider uh, I I would consider one more winner Mark before we move on to the losers Donovan Peoples Jones like I always thought he could play and they have gotten nothing from Jamison Williams really. And Marvin Jones is gone. And Cleef Raymond is like a gadgety guy and Josh Reynolds, as much as I like the shower narrative between him and J Jared Goff, I think Donovan Peoples Jones is probably more talented. So yeah, if you're in a deep league, I would consider Donovan Peoples Jones an interesting ad just to see what happens there in Detroit. But yeah, Jack on the loser side, of things from the fallout from the deadline. What do you think in there? Yeah, I mean, you brought up Donovan Peoples-Jones. We can take the flip side there and talk about guys like Jamison Williams and Josh Reynolds, who previously had, uh, you know, a decent role all to themselves, especially in Reynolds' case. And then for Jamison, you were kind of hoping that he would ascend into that full-time role. Um, and now adding Donovan Peoples-Jones, just another competent pass catcher there uh, to add to the mix. Two other guys I think were, were losers would be someone we've talked about a lot on here, which would be Marvin Mims. There were rumors that both Jerry Judy and Corlin Sutton were on the trade block. Mims to this point still is, is only running around on like at most 50% of Russ Wilson's dropbacks um, and, and a lot of the time even lower. So a Sutton or Judy trade would have been really good news for him just in terms of playing time. Um, but obviously that didn't happen and he's stuck in kind of a wide receiver three by committee role. Another guy, uh, a big name, Devontae Adams, uh, who was the, the, the Raiders were adamant the whole process that they weren't going to trade him. But just because, I mean, he hasn't been getting the volume that he should be getting and the Raiders are so bad. There were some uh, whispers that he could be moved. He was not. Um, he should still get plenty of volume. But, you know, when you're talking about Devontae Adams potentially going to Dallas or Kansas City or, or any of these places that people were maybe partially wish casting for him uh, and then it didn't end up happening. So that's a little bit of a disappointment um, along the same lines as Mims, I guess would be Tajay Spears with the Derrick Henry trade rumors. Um, just the fact that it didn't happen and Spears is not ascending into a clear RB one role. Um, so those are the guys I think that spring to mind in terms of trade deadline losers. Yeah. I've been carrying Mims and, Jamison Williams on a couple teams where had like medium sized benches. I think in medium sized bench leagues now, I'm probably okay just dumping those guys. You know, there's just probably someone out there, some running back who's one injury away, or someone else that's probably a better hold for me right now than Marvin Mims or Jamison Williams in the wake of the deadline. Uh, 
I would also throw into the mix here, Mark, the Washington stuff. They get rid of Montez Sweat and Chase Young. I mean, this defense was already probably my favorite to attack in the entire NFL. Some of the best game environments you get because Redskins, I'm sorry, Commanders have been uh, uh, among the league leaders in pass rate over expectation for the entire season. And so you get a team that wants to throw against a team on a defense that is just bad and has gotten a lot worse at the deadline. And so I feel way better right now about McLaurin and Dotson than I did before. We have Dotson up 16 spots, McLaurin up five spots this week in the rankings. So yeah, I think that would be another sneaky winner would be the Washington guys there. Yeah, I think I think pass catchers there more so than running yeah. backs for sure, just given the the likely game scripts. And then again, just any any offense that's going up against Washington is is basically a winner after their moves. Agreed. We shouldn't bury the lead here. The lead, I think, is in the wake of Kirk Cousins' injury. And we got a, a question from a good friend of the show, J. Lude. Hope all is well, buddy. J. Lude said, how much of a hit will Jefferson and Addison take in projections with Dobbs at the helm? for the Vikings. So since we last spoke, Mark and Jack, Kirk Cousins is done for the year. Kirk Cousins, obviously one of the most productive fantasy quarterbacks for all of his players. It is a big hit to these guys. We have not, we have taken big chunks in the top 150 out of Addison and KJ Osborne. Justin Jefferson, though, seems close to a return here. So yeah, Mark, what do you think about Vikings rest of season as we expect Dobbs, Josh Dobbs, the brainchild to start the rest of the way. We're trying to balance things a little bit here because you have the cousins Achilles injury. So he's out for the year. You have Justin Jefferson optimist optimism around his hamstring injury and that he'll be able to return from IR when eligible in week 10. And then you have the Vikings trading for Josh Dobbs and him potentially playing in week nine. It sounds like they'll go with Jaron Hall in week nine and, and Dobbs will be fully up to speed and start in week 10. Um, so a lot of factors here that that we're trying to analyze for the most part, you know, it's it's a it's a big dock, I think, for Addison and Osborne, especially with with the optimism around J. Jeff returning here soon and then the downgrading quarterback as well. Um, I think it's a little less hurtful to Hawkinson just because, you know, Dobbs has been more of a short ADOC guy in, in Arizona. Um, Hawkinson's role in this offense is just so secure. And it, we've seen even with Jefferson, his targets, you know, still be high and and more secure than Addison's in the in that wide receiver two role. So um certainly rest of season outlook, I think overall it's a downgrade without Kirk Cousins, obviously, and going to Josh Dobbs. Um I think Dobbs in there helps a little bit over Jaron Hall. But in terms of play calling, I think, you know, the the Vikings have been one of the most pass heavy offenses in the NFL since Kevin O'Connell took over. So I th- I think that's still going to be his philosophy is, you know, throw first and operate the offense through the passing game. That's certainly where most of their talent lies rather than in the backfield with with Madison and Cam Akers. So I still think this is going to be a pass heavy team, but the efficiency we can certainly be concerned about, but they they do have great pass catchers still. So if Dobbs can just play a distributor, I, 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 I think it's not as dire as maybe in, we initially thought once Cousins went down. Yeah. You know, my concern is that this has been one of the most pass-centric teams in the league. And, and like you said, I don't expect them to suddenly become run heavy, but I feel like they'll try more. You know, like they'll try the, to stick with the run for longer than maybe they would have with Cousins previously. But yeah, I mean, to your point, they're still going to have to throw the ball because the run game is still going to be broken. We saw what Josh Dobbs can do for tight end play in Arizona. So I think Hawkinson is still okay. We've only dropped him eight spots. We do have Justin Jefferson here at 25, Addison down to 66 overall. And honestly, like if you had to drop KJ Osborne at this point, it's probably okay. The other uh, big quarterback uh news here jack is the switch that the atlanta falcons are making you know after arthur smith said that it was toxic group think to suggest that desmond ritter is playing poorly and should be replaced arthur smith the following week goes out and replaces uh desmond ritter with taylor heineke we have a pretty big sample on taylor heineke i thought he had some really good games for carolina i thought he had some really good games for washington in his past it's just not consistent you know it's like he seems to sputter out when he gets these chances. I think he'll be more aggressive and more accurate downfield than Desmond Ritter was, which is so much better for Kyle Pitts. I mean, Kyle Pitts has an awesome role. It's just so much is uncatchable down the field from Ritter. So I think it's a pretty big boost for Kyle Pitts. 
Drake London's dealing with his groin thing. Doesn't sound major, but yeah. Jack, what do you think about Falcon stuff rest of season now that we know they have gone to Taylor Heineke? Yeah, I'm with you on Pitts for sure and the, and the downfield stuff. I think in general, it's probably an ever so slight net positive because Ritter, I don't think, has been fantastic through his career, whereas like you said, uh, Heineke has shown flashes of competence. Um, but I, I don't think it's like, you know, a massive upgrade and, and just because they move away from Desmond Ritter, like the passing offense is going to be fixed, I think. Um, it, it's, it really is a fairly neutral from a talent standpoint, but then from a stylistic standpoint, um, the stuff about pushing the ball downfield more, uh, will likely come to fruition. So I, I do agree on that. Let's keep it moving with quarterbacks here. Uh, Mark, the Raiders sound like they're going to go with AOC Aiden O'Connell. I, I haven't looked into it too much. Do you think that this is permanent? Will AOC start? the rest of the season. And then what do you think about Raiders outlook now that we know AOC has replaced Jimmy Garoppolo? It sounds to me like O'Connell is, is going to be their expected starter the rest of the season. As long as he's healthy, Albert Breer did, uh, had some comments about, you know, the Raiders likely one of the last straws for Josh McDaniels as head coach. There was him starting Brian Hoyer over O'Connell in, in that game against the bears a few weeks ago. I mean, from the outside, it seemed like an egregious decision, and I think from, from the inside, they they kind of figured that out as well as as Hoyer lost like his 13th straight start, you know, and and so it's hard to comment here for me personally just because there's so much uncertainty. We have a new head coach there, we have a new offensive coordinator and play caller, and now a new quarterback. So there's a lot going on here, and in, in general, like you know, the, this Raiders offense has been bottom five and plays per game so far, um, so it can't get like too much worse just from an overall high high level view here. Um, I'm, I think O'Connell inserting certainly adds a wider range of outcomes, and we, you know, we kind of know what we're going to get from Jimmy Garoppolo in that offense. So I think here, as as long as the targets stay condensed between Josh Jacobs, Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, I, I think you know we can kind of expect similar output. Hopefully, a little bit better from this Raiders offense, just with you know Josh McDaniels out the door. Hopefully, some dysfunction leaves there but um it's certainly a lot of moving parts and, and something i think we're gonna have to kind of reconfigure each week especially projections wise i expect it to remain tight you know i mean it, aoc started that game um against the chargers and by the way aoc was awesome 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 in the preseason and then he started that game against the chargers they got down i think it was like 24 to 7 at the half or something so a lot of this was garbage time but he came back and, and he finished the game 24 of 39 for 238. But more importantly, Josh Jacobs got almost every running back touch. Josh Jacobs also saw 11 targets in that game. Obviously, a lot was in garbage time comeback mode. Devontae Adams got 13 targets. Joey Myers got four. In other words, it was still very tight in that game. And these are the only three Raiders that we do have ranked in the top 150 now. Jacobs and Devontae both in the 20s. Jacoby Myers in the 59s. At 59. I, I don't think... Um, uh, it's that big a downgrade, you know. I, yeah, I would not affect my out rest season outlook. And Jimmy G has just been so bad. So yeah. I, I think most of these guys too just have to be holds at the moment, especially after that prime time performance. I, I just don't really think anyone's going to give you fair market value for the Raiders' top options, even though you know things are kind of bleak right now. All right, last quarterback change I wanted to talk about was the Titans' decision to go to Will Levis. Now they didn't trade Tannehill at the deadline. They didn't trade. Derrick Henry, they didn't trade DeAndre Hopkins. So maybe the Will Levis experiment will be shorter than we expected. I don't know. But if he plays like he did in his first start, they have to stick with him. I mean, my God, you know, he looked like Joe Montana out there in his first start with a rocket arm. It wasn't like, I don't know. I, you can watch him. I tweeted, uh, somebody did a video of every Will Levis's throw. You know, he was chucking bombs out there. Um, and DeAndre Hopkins was somehow wide open against the Falcons for a bunch of them. That's obviously not that sustainable. He also checked down a ton. So yeah, Jack, what do you think about Titan stuff rest of season now that Will Levis is out of the bag? Yeah, I think it will come down to how well Levis plays. Um, like it, it's not like Tannehill has been all that impressive this season. So I do think if Levis plays well, he's, he's going to hold on to the job. The rest of the year, he did. He was super big play dependent, like you said. He was at 8.2 yards per attempt. But if you take away like a play or two where Hopkins just happened to be like 10 yards away from the closest defender, um, that number would have tanked, and we'd probably be talking about him a whole lot differently. He also did have a couple near miss big plays, like Chig dropped 
like a wide open, like 40 yard pass. Um, but I mean, on the whole, I think you have to be optimistic given how Levis played. Like, it's not like this offense is going to be anything super special under Tannehill. So just any semblance of upside, I think, is a positive. Um, and then it, it just comes down to how Levis plays uh, over the next few weeks before Tannehill is ready to return. Yeah, I, I have Hopkins on a couple of teams and I, I feel better about it now. You know, like there was a chance when Tannehill went down, if Will Levis sucked, it was like stone dead for this team and maybe they would have made trades if levis sucked uh in that game i don't know i kind of doubt it but um but yeah certainly things looking up for tennessee i lied we need to do one more quarterback thing sounds like kyler murray is very very close to returning either this week or next week talk to silva a bunch about this yesterday mark but wanted to get your take on rest of season stuff with arizona we have trey mcbride up to 104th overall on his breakout also James Conner, we keep moving up the rest of the season top 150. He's expected back pretty soon. And then obviously you have Marquise Brown, who was not dealt to the trade line. I thought that was a trade that could have actually happened. Like Cardinals want to rebuild. Marquise Brown is a valuable piece of a very good team. I thought that one could have happened, but didn't. Uh, what do you think rest of season on Cardinals stuff here, Mark? Uh, there's a little give and take here. You know, a little some pros and cons. I, I think just given the schedule, the, the Cardinals are on the road at Cleveland this week and then are at home against Atlanta in week 10. And, and so it, it kind of aligns for Kyler to come back week 10. And I think that gives us a bump to, uh, you know, Marquise Brown and Trey McBride specifically. That's kind of why they either stay put or in McBride's case moved up a lot. Um, but then looking at this, you know, like their rest of season schedule, their, their buy is in week 14, which kind of hurts us as, as fantasy players, that might be the final week of the regular season in most leagues and and you're going to need, you know, you're going to want your studs in that week. I do think James Conner is a great either kind of buy low right now or an ad. If, if anyone dropped him, it looks like he'll, he's eligible to come off IR in week 10 and with, you know, Kyler's return in that week as well. I think the outlook for James Conner is at least decent, but again, that week 14 buy, and then in week 15, they play San Francisco who is, is more vulnerable to the run, but still a good defense overall. And then they have Philadelphia in week 17, which would be the fantasy championship if you make it there. So, you know, again, it, it's it's some good and bad here. I, I think overall we can expect this offense to be more efficient and score more points with Kyler at the helm. But given the late buy and the rough playoff schedule, I'm, I'm still, you know, reluctant to be too optimistic here. All right. Uh, let's keep it moving actually to the Panthers backfield here. Jack, we saw Chuba usurp miles sanders now we have chuba up to 100th overall miles sanders 123rd i mean not only did i thought it would be like oh chuba's starting and he'll play you know 60 percent of the snaps they went full chuba i mean miles sanders played like nine snaps that surprised me you know i i thought they would still keep miles in the mix here full chuba surprised me man i don't know how sticky that is not like chuba played well either i'm not sure what kind of moves you can make around this hopefully you guys added chuba based on some of the news ahead of last week um if he was available but yeah what do you think about the chuba mile stuff going forward jack yeah i mean i don't think chuba's a bad buy right now considering that he did have the exact workload we're looking for um the panthers on the season that have thrown the ball to, to their running backs a good amount even if they haven't been uh, a great offense. And then Chuba also got like all the goal line carries. He had four or five carries at the goal line. He got stuffed on, you know, like a lot uh, on them, but you know, he got them. Um, and he just did not have the fantasy production to back up that usage. So if someone is valuing Chuba as a player who only scored, you know, 10 or fewer fantasy points, I, I think that he's a perfectly viable RB2 in the short term. I think Sanders, honestly, might be pretty much dead. I mean, Raheem Blackshear had more touches than him on Sunday. Um, there were reports pregame that Sanders was at least going to be in the third down pass catching role, and that did not end up happening. He only ran nine routes on 44 Bryce Young dropbacks. 67% um, of snaps for Chuba. So I, I think Chuba is an interesting buy candidate, even if the – like, I don't think he has top eight upside in this offense, especially since Blackshear and Sanders aren't going to go away completely. But the fantasy production in week eight was not what you would expect given the usage you got. And if someone is willing to sell you the production, um, I, I think you should buy the usage. Yeah, it's an interesting spot, man. I, 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 they, 
can they really give 25 million, 13 million guaranteed to Miles Sanders and just be like, well, showers, buddy. We're going to play Chuba Hubbard the rest of the year. I guess you can. It's just, I respect it. You know, no one respects to good torching of a bunch of money more than me. I, I've been doing it a lot of weeks this year, but, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. Really interesting spot. Let's get to some of your questions here. Jason says, would you buy low on Devante Adams right now? I know we just talked about this, Mark, but I think it's an interesting discussion no one in the world is going to want Devonte adams after what they saw and this quarterback change we still have him 22nd overall i feel like the market generally is going to be lower on Devonte adams here so if you could give up like a fourth or fifth round value to get Devonte adams that might actually get it done do you think you would do that to try to get it done on Devonte adams I think so. Like I mentioned, I'm I'm a, I'm a little uh, butthurt right now about what happened, what's been going on with Devonte lately. But I do think the market is probably lower on him than they should be because I don't know when I when I think about it, like you know, head coach is gone. Okay, if I'm coming in and I want and I want to improve the Raiders, what am I going to do? I'm going to try and get the ball to Devonte Adams as much as possible, especially with a rookie quarterback. Like we know Devonte can still get open, so uh, it's just it's just a matter of, of the quarterback getting him the ball. So I, I I do think that he is a high end wide receiver two, low end wide receiver one still, and and he's extremely productive when he gets you know ten plus targets no matter what. So um, I, I do think it's a decent buy low if, if you can stomach it, and in the ceiling, like the payoff is likely a lot higher than people are anticipating at the moment. Question from Josh says. Uh... How does the impending return of Kyler Murray impact his pass catchers? Will more targets be finding wide receivers or is the tight end target rate a function of the offensive design? So I think it's a fair question, but when Kyler was playing last year, Marquise was getting a ton of targets. I mean, one, two, three, four with double digits, a bunch more with seven plus. I think the volume for, and the quality of volume for Marquise Brown is about to go up a lot. And like, I don't want to say that Trey McBride is a sell because I have Trey McBride like everywhere and I'm not going to personally sell him because I really need him. And I feel like he can finish among the top 10 tight ends the rest of the way. However, if you have a tight end already and you're carrying Trey McBride too, I think it's a really interesting interesting time to sell Trey McBride. A lot of that uh, production obviously came in garbage time. We saw him down the stretch last year, airball a few times with 100% of the snaps roll which was certainly scary. So I love Trey McBride, but if someone is going to give me something valuable for my second tight end, I, I would be doing that uh, in a heartbeat. Um, yeah, like Jake says, thoughts on Trey McBride rest of the season, considering trying to package him with Madison or James Cook for a running back upgrade. Yes, if you are okay at tight end, I would 100%, 100% be doing that. Jay Flabella says, my team needs weekly upside at wide receiver. Can DeAndre Hopkins be that guy or should I try to flip him off of the big game. So Andrew Hopkins had a big game, as you talked about. He probably fits with Levis maybe a little bit better than Tannehill. We have DeAndre Hopkins at 63rd overall. I think that's a pretty fair rank. Other wide receivers around him would be Lockett, Jacoby Myers, Chris Godwin, Deontay Johnson, Jordan Addison, DJ Moore types. I think that's a really fair spot in there. Jack, is there anything you would be doing if you needed upside at wide receiver? And you've had DeAndre Hopkins on your team. Yeah, I don't feel the need right now to, to sell DeAndre Hopkins just because he had a big game. He's, he's still getting on the season a high 20s target share. Uh, that's elite. Obviously, Tennessee doesn't throw the ball a whole lot, but the volume, I think, is still going to be elite. And then he just kind of showed to us the kind of weekly upside that is possible for him with Levis. So from a weekly upside perspective, I mean, I, I think that it's definitely there for him. And I, I don't really feel the need to trade him. Yep. Good question from MLB Pmau. He says, what's your take on the Kenneth Walker Charbonnet roles rest of season? So this one kind of came out of left field. I mean, Kenneth Walker came into the game with a calf injury, but he was not on the final injury report. They asked Pete Carroll after the game, what was up with Zach Charbonnet playing so much? Was Kenneth Walker's calf bothering him? Pete Carroll, who, you know, is very much a liar when he's talking to the media, but for what it's worth, he said that uh, Kenneth Walker's calf was not an issue. They got Charbonnet in there. Charbonnet was running well and they stuck with it. And honestly, I kind of believe him on this one. Like I, I think they look at it as simply as Charbonnet got in there for whatever role he had, the last two minute role. And then he broke off some big runs. They were like, Oh, let's stick with it. You know, like sometimes it's just that simple. And I, I think that was the case. I fully expect Kenneth Walker 
to have a really good role rest of season. But Charbonnet is going to play 30, maybe 40% of the snaps. And in some weeks where he gets hot, maybe they'll play him like they did this past where he played 60% of the snaps. So it's a confusing situation right now, Mark. We still have Kenneth Walker pretty high here. 17th overall in the rest of the season, top 150. What do you think about Walker versus Charbonnet? I think when we look back on it, that this past week, the the snaps and touch split will be, you know, a bit of an anomaly. I, I do think Kenneth Walker is still going to be the RB one there. And, and, you know, I would be a little more concerned if this was a game where Seattle had like 25 total rushing attempts and Charbonnet got 18 and, and Walker got seven, but they only had 13 total rush attempts from, from the running backs. I mean, um, Charbonnet had five and, and Walker had eight still. So even though the snaps, you know, went to Charbonnet, I do think like Walker's role is more secure heading forward. And, and, you know, there, there's really no reason to go away from Walker, right? It's not like he's been playing poorly this season. So I think it'll probably flip back his way. And, and I, I still view Walker as, as a, you know, RB one, and then Charbonnet clearly one of the most valuable handcuffs in fantasy football right now with, with some weekly standalone value on his own. I would agree. All I would say is that Kenneth Walker has to keep playing well to keep this job. They they have shown that if Kenneth Walker starts to struggle, like they'll just go to Charbonnet, you know, and, and yeah. And like, you're going to get a lot of games where Walker looks like he's struggling because he's such a boom bust kind of runner. So it's a bit precarious right now for Walker, I feel like, but I still would expect him to be ahead the rest of season. Ty Landis asks, would you deal Jameer Gibbs right now, assuming the role is diminished again once David Montgomery returns? Lions are on a bye this week. When they get back, we do expect Dave Montgomery to be back from his rib injury. Before Dave Montgomery went down, I mean, Jameer Gibbs was strict change of pace. Given how well he's played, he has to play more. I mean, absolutely has to. Now, I do think Dave Montgomery will sustain the goal line role, which is obviously very, very valuable on this team. So yeah, what do you think about selling Jameer Gibbs right now, Jack, off of his big game? I mean, obviously, if someone doesn't know that Dave Montgomery is coming back, then yeah, you should be ripping them off. But most people, I assume, would know that Dave Montgomery is about to be back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it it depends wholly on what you can get for him. And I think there's going to be a wide range of outcomes in different leagues on what you can get for him. We have him 54th. Um, I, I think that that's like a pretty fair ranking. I definitely would not sell him if you're getting someone who you know is a mid fifth round pick but if someone is buying the production uh that he had in week eight and is thinking that Gibbs is gonna is gonna keep a pretty big role in the primary runner job even once Montgomery's back then that's a scenario in which I I don't mind selling him oh yeah agreed and this team is so run heavy in the red zone it's outrageous I mean that's how you get 17 or whatever touchdowns Jamal Williams had last year and Dave Montgomery was averaging like a touchdown a game in his games too. I think that's actually somewhat sustainable for David Montgomery. So yeah, I, I think, you know, what me and Silva talked about yesterday on team by team, something around 50, 50 split. I think Gibbs has earned that, you know, but it's not going to be more than that. I don't think. In, in general too, the Lions are a team I'm more interested in buying than selling. Just they play eight of their final nine games in a dome after their buy. And uh, so I think, you know, we can feel good about this offense moving forward. So I, I'd rather hold on to those pieces rather than you know, especially the backfield. We're not really sure how it's going to shake out, but I'd rather hold on and, uh, you know, hopefully both are viable down the stretch. Here's a question that I can't face answering, Mark. Uh, Kened's asked, should we be selling Christian Watson low and getting out while we can, or just ride it out and hope this Packers offense figures something out in the second half of the season? I have a take here, but uh, I'll let Mark go first because I'm just too tilted to even uh, talk about it. So, So go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think I think if you're not going to play him this week or like the next couple of weeks and you really need help at another position and you're fighting for the playoffs, then I, I think it's fine to sell low and get someone you can feel a little bit more confident in starting. Um, I'm still holding out a little bit of hope just because of the playoff schedule. Uh, and, you know, starting in week 14, they play the Giants, then the Bucks, Panthers and, and Vikings, which are all positive matchups. And, you know, hopefully like the offense can come around then and we could get some spike weeks from Watson. Um, I'm certainly getting, you know, more pessimistic as the week goes on that as the weeks go on that, you know, it's going to turn around for him, but, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have him in a few leagues where he's kind of like the wide receiver four for me and I'm fine just holding him on the bench and, and hoping that things turn around. But yeah, I, I don't know. I think it kind of depends on team need a little bit. 
he continues to earn targets at a reasonable rate and he continues to earn end zone targets at a really high rate. The problem is that they're not very catchable. Like they're catchable. They're not going to go down as uncatchable, but it's really hard to kind of make the plays. He's not getting a lot of separation. It seems and Jordan love is just not that accurate on throws that need to be back shoulder. That's just what I've seen from a tape bro perspective from an actual like data perspective. He looks fine. I mean, he's playing a ton. He's earning targets. He's he's earning end zone targets. I would personally rather have easily Deontay Johnson. Even I would rather have Jordan Addison, even with Josh Dobbs. Rather have DJ Moore. As close on pickings. Would rather have McLaurin, especially now that they traded away Sweat. And I'd probably rather have Gabe Davis just for quarterback play, you know? And so those are the kind of guys that we have in the same tier. If you could get those guys for Christian Watson, I know wide receiver for wide receiver trades are really hard to get. I, I would be okay with that. And like, if you needed stability of points on your team, like Josh Downs is going to catch five balls every week. I mean, he's just gonna, I mean, and so if that's what you need and you can get Josh Downs for Christian Watson, I think that's okay too. But yeah, um, it's ugly. Let's keep it moving here. Uh, thoughts on Isaiah Pacheco rest of season. He has a great role, but doesn't seem to have big games. So the reason I think that Isaiah Pacheco doesn't have big games is because Andy Reid like constantly is trying to outsmart himself at the goal line. I mean, he calls like Noah Gray, like double reverse at the goal line instead of just turning and handing it to Isaiah Pacheco. And that hurts a lot in fantasy, but Pacheco's pass game role has been awesome lately, which is actually uh, really interesting to me. He's coming off of a dud here. Jack, what do you think about maybe a buy low or any other thoughts on Pacheco? Yeah, I'm pretty into Pacheco. I mean, like you said, the, he's been at a, around a 10% target share recently. He's also, uh, the, over the past month, he's only at 3.6 yards per carry, which I think is a big part of it. We've seen him be a big play guy in the past, 4.9 yards per carry. His rookie season still at, at 4.3 this year. He just hasn't broken the, the long touchdowns uh, that we kind of got used to seeing last year. But between his rush share growing uh, and Clyde Edwards Alaire role really going away. And in, in week eight, we really saw no usage for CEH when the, the chiefs were trailing, which I think is a good sign that in close games, they're really going to lean into Pacheco more and they trust him a lot. So I, I do think Pacheco is a decent by low the, the goal line work um, or lack thereof because of the play calling is definitely a concern. But I think that this workload that he's getting is, you know, 15 carries per game and, two or three targets a game on the best offense in football or a top three offense in football uh, is, is pretty valuable. So I do think he's a good buy candidate. Roto talker says what's an acceptable return for AJ Brown. I'm continuing to battle for a playoff spot. And after losing Nick Chubb, my running backs have been lacking, man, such a bad beat. You started AJ Brown, Nick Chubb. I mean, you should just be dominating anyways. Uh, ideally he says, I'll be getting back a wide receiver running back combo for AJ Brown. Trading AJ Brown now is fun because I'm sure every single person in your league wants AJ Brown. We have him up to fourth overall in all of fantasy football. I would start out asking for outlandish stuff, like outlandish stuff and just see where it goes from there. I would also be sure that you don't just talk to one owner in your league. Like you should post on your message board. Hey, I'm thinking about trading AJ Brown. Send me your best offer and you'll get, I think, some absurd offers given the way that this guy's been playing. I kind of think it's sustainable the way he's been playing, though. This Eagles defense is nowhere near as good as it was last year, and that helps them get their pass attempts up. But yeah, Mark, if you wanted to trade A.J. Brown, what kind of stuff would you be looking for? Yeah, like like you said, I'd be asking for a massive haul here. I think if, you, if you're trying for a combo, um, I, straight up, you know, I think you could probably trade him for like Eckler and ETN. I think those are, you know, CMC is probably still valued above him. I think those three yeah. running backs are, are like a clear tier of their own right now. And then you kind of get to the second tier of running backs. We have ranked in the 16 to 24 range, which is like Pollard, Kenneth Walker, Kamara, Barkley. You know, if you got one of those guys, plus another, you know, either high end wide receiver two or, or maybe like a CD lamb type, you know, combo, I, I think that'd be okay. But yeah, my asking price would be really high here. AJ Brown, just such a beast. And as you mentioned, I, you know, while, while he's probably not going to get over 125 yards every week, uh, you know, he's he's still going to post solid numbers every week. So I'd, I'd want a big haul. I, I have an idea. What if, like, if you can afford it to keep him on your bench for a week or two, what if you got, like, Justin Jefferson, who 
I'm sure whoever drafted Justin Jefferson right now is like desperate to get out because their record's probably really bad since he's been out for so long. If I could get like Justin Jefferson and ETN for AJ Brown, I would probably do that. Uh, I don't know if that's even possible, but that's something that I would be asking for. Um, and they're like, I don't think Justin Jefferson is dead just because Josh Dobbs is going to be his QB. Justin Jefferson is the truth. Uh, last one here, Jack. Uh, Jay Buck says, at what point in the season should a team that's sitting in first or second look at securing handcuffs and playoff stashes? So I know you've been working on this for the article. Why don't you tell the people what your plan is for the article for, for this kind of stuff, for this playoff, preparing for the playoff type stuff, and then any ideas you have for handcuffs and playoff stashes right now? Yeah, I mean, we we do a buy sell article every week, and and as we get into the second half of the season, it's going to start focusing more on this type of stuff and guys that you should get uh, if you're in a position for the playoffs. But I mean, to answer the question, if you're seven and one or, or eight and zero right now, I think that now is the time to start getting those handcuffs and playoff stashes. Um, and that's a running back and wide receiver. I think if you're in first or second going into week. 11 or 12 then probably week 12 then you can start thinking about adding extra defenses to prepare to to stream in the playoffs um but yeah i mean if if you're looking at like a 95 percent playoff probability right now i think that it would be very wise to start optimizing for the playoffs even though it's only uh week nine all right to end the show we're going to each give two moves to make as we do each and every week here, I'll let Mark kick us off with your first move to make ahead of week nine. Uh, you're on mute, Mark. I touched on this uh, a little bit earlier when we were talking about the the deadline winners, and I think he's probably being undervalued still right now in the fantasy market, and that's Joe Mixon. So I'm going to say buy Joe Mixon here for my first move to make. Um, I mentioned Chase Brown has been placed on IR and there really just hasn't been any competition for Joe Mixon in this backfield. He's handled 91% of the running back rush attempts, almost 80% of the running back targets. And uh, when he gets in the goal line, all the work's going to him. He's handled all 13 of the Bengals rush attempts inside the 10 yard line. So I think the touchdowns are going to come. Joe Burrow is back to hundred percent health. It looks like this offense is going to continue to hum. They're past their by. I think I think people are still, you know, a little hesitant on Joe Mixon's talent. They, they, they probably don't think he's that good. And um, I think he should be a locked in RB one the rest of the way. So I'd be buying him as an RB one and, and think he's a bit undervalued right now. Still, they don't think he's that good because he isn't that good. But <laughs> that might not matter. That might not matter when you have a really good pass game role and a really good goal line role on an offense like the Bengals. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, for my first move, I'm going to do by Chris Olave. He just had five catchers for 46 yards. He has uh, 103 yards over his past two games, but he's coming off a game where he had uh, above a 30% target share and 170 air yards. That's pretty much as good of usage as you can get from a wide receiver. Uh, in week seven, he had a 27% target share. So the usage is there. The production has just not been. Uh, I mean, we literally saw a ball like bounce off his helmet that would have been a huge difference maker in, in how Olave is perceived right now uh, from a fantasy standpoint. Now they play the Bears, which is pretty much uh, as good of a get-right spot as you can for a, a struggling wide receiver. So I think that now is a pretty good time to buy into Chris Olave. All right. Bye. I couldn't believe that ball hit him in the face. That was going to be like a 40-yard touchdown. I mean, that hit him right in the face. And I had Tony Pollard have a screen at the 10-yard line go right off his face also. That would have been a touchdown too. Just... We got to sim to the end of the season. I, I can't take many. I cannot take many more weeks like, like last week. Okay. Uh, I am going to go. I'm going to go to Indy. And I'm going to go with by Jonathan Taylor. Under Gardner Minshew, this offense is so fantasy friendly because they're playing at this outrageously fast pace. The defense is atrocious. And Gardner Minshew throws to the running back so much. And so Jonathan Taylor in the first half against the Saints, which wasn't an easy matchup. First half against the Saints, 11 carries for 94 yards. For some inexplicable reason, he only gets one carry and one target in the second half. I thought I saw him limping. I could be wrong. I need to go back and actually watch the second half again to see if I could see anything with Jonathan Taylor. But as far as I can tell, he's not hurt. And they just decided to stick with Moss for a lot of that in the second half. That just can't sustain. I mean, 
from every level. I know Moss has been awesome. That just can't sustain. When Jonathan Taylor goes 11 94 in the second in the first half, you have to keep feeding him. And I think this offense is actually be way more fantasy friendly than anyone thought it would be with Minshew for the rest of the year. It's just such a good setup. Bad defense, playing fast. And JT is such a game breaker also. So yeah, they lost this game by riding Moss in the second half. It's time to go full alpha Jonathan Taylor. So uh, I'd be buying Jonathan Taylor right now. Mark, your second and final move to make. I'm going to go with sell George Kittle. Uh, this is a little, I think maybe a little tricky just because he's on by this week, but I think, you know, when people are really struggling at the tight end position, we just had Darren Waller go down as well. And, and uh, people are searching for any sort of production and you can easily look at Kittle's last few games without Debo and, and sell people a story that, you know, he's going to continue to be involved in this 49ers offense. And I think that Debo is very likely to come back and be healthy and active in week 10 following their week nine bye. And, and we've seen George Kittle's target shares just be, you know, c- kind of crater a bit in those games and, and be really unpredictable. So I think now is a good time to sell high on George Kittle. Uh, they have a decent pl- fantasy playoff schedule as well. And I, I think if there's a team in your league that has, you know, is locked into the playoffs, you can sell them on George Kittle's upside for the playoffs and potentially winning them a week. And you can get a more functional, reliable player over the next three to four weeks if, if you're trying to make the playoffs. So uh, I, I'd, I'd lean to sell high on George Kittle right now. All right. Sell high on George Kittle. Jack, your second and final move. Yeah, I'm going to go with buy Raheem or sell Raheem Mostert. He's currently the, the RB3 in fantasy on the season, but Devon H. Van uh should return in one more dolphins game and then after the dolphins buy and jeff wilson took on a little bit more of an expanded role last week i mean i i think most third is pretty clearly ahead of wilson at this point and Salvin ahmed but there's at least a non-zero chance that the wilson role just continues to grow um like it like it did last year and then but the thesis of selling most third is really just how good devon h had was early in the season he's averaging 12.1 yards per carry which is unheard of um speed we haven't seen at the running back position since chris johnson so most third i think the he, the touchdown variance has been on his side and that's primarily why he's the fantasy rb3 but just there's so many mouths to feed in that dolphins backfield especially once h comes back um so I, I think he's a pretty sensible sell candidate yeah i think that's interesting also long injury history for a guy who's over 30 years old at the running back position in Mostert feels like a bit of a ticking time bomb there too with him. And yeah, I think he'll be efficient anytime he touches it the rest of the season, but touch count, I think is going to get capped here pretty soon. Would agree with Jack on the volume point for Mr. Mostert. My final move to make is going to be buy on a guy who I just have so much respect for guys who can earn targets. Deontay Johnson is one of the best in the entire NFL at earning targets. And I know it's so ugly. His touchdown rate is like pathetic. I mean, it's literally zero over his last, over his last like 200 catches, but even for his career, it's not that great. If, especially when it's not with Ben Roethlisberger, but gosh, you're going to fall into the end zone when you're earning targets at the rate that Deontay Johnson earns targets. I also think that the picket Trubisky stuff is like, overblown it doesn't matter who's there at quarterback they're both effectively the same and they're both going to be able to get the ball I think to Deontay Johnson you get such a good floor every week on Deontay Johnson on your team it is really hard for him to fail on a week-to-week basis he's going to get like five for 50 so often and that's pretty valuable for a team that's already has explosive playmakers at other spots you know I, I think about this more in DFS than season long but maybe in season long we should be thinking about I can't have like three wide receivers like Christian Watson on my team because there's so many weeks where I'm just going to airball, but I can balance out a Christian Watson type with a Deontay Johnson type and hopefully get a little bit of a floor there on a season long team. But yeah, by Deontay Johnson would be my move. Oh, I was my main point on Deontay Johnson role change, man. He used to see so many targets around the line of scrimmage. Now he's earning targets deeper down the field. His first two games back. I mean, his ADOT's been up 13, 14 yards. I mean, that's a big change. And I don't know how sticky that'll be, but just if you can earn targets at that rate and have them down the field, that's really valuable. All right. That is going to do it for this week nine rest of season top 150 show. Appreciate you all being here. We'll be back tomorrow. I'll be talking to Reynolds and Gary 
about the awards market. Of course, one of my favorite markets in all of NFL betting. And then we'll be back Friday night for a special Establish the Show with myself and Silva. For Mark, for Jack, for everyone behind the scenes on the rest of season top 150 project, I'm at Good luck, everybody.